I was in Sheffield, London, and the plane was a little delayed, so I always go to the bookshelf, the bookshop I love reading. And I bought a book called Why We Sleep by Dr Matthew Walker, and this book opened my eyes on sleep. We will learn from Barbara O'Neill, a leading figure in the field of wellness and natural health. Barbara is widely acclaimed for her expertise in holistic health and nutrition, and her insightful approach to well-being. In this video, Barbara will delve into the crucial topic of sleep. She explains why getting quality sleep is essential for overall health and how it impacts our daily lives. We'll learn about how during sleep the brain clears out toxins and waste products that accumulate throughout the day, which is essential for preventing cognitive decline and diseases like Alzheimer's. Barbara will also shed light on what happens during non-rapid eye movement sleep, and why these stages are so vital for our body's recovery and restoration. Additionally, she discussed the significance of achieving a full eight hours of sleep each night, and how this amount of rest contributes to our physical and mental well-being. Join us as Barbara O'Neill provides valuable insights and practical tips on optimizing your sleep for a healthier, more energized life. And he quotes a lot of research in this book, and he shows that probably in the 1950s, people were beginning to research sleep. And they first of all um, wired up rats to see how they sleep, and they found that rats did 90 minute cycles through the night. And some cycles, the eyes were moving rapidly. They're asleep, but the eyes are moving rapidly. And what the electrodes showed is that when the eyes were moving rapidly, the brain was very active. And then there were times when the eyes were still, and then the brain was relatively <coughs> still. So they called the rapid time, rapid eye movement, and the slow time, uh, non-rapid eye movement. Barbara will share what they discovered. So let's have a look at what they found happened. So in non-rapid eye movement time, there's a courier system. What's the courier system? At the back, in the base of your brain, there's your hippocampus. And your hippocampus is your short-term memory unit. So everything that's happening through the day is, has gone into your short-term memory unit. But when you lie down to sleep at night, there's a courier system that takes those memories and takes them up to the cortex, which is the top part of the brain. And that's your long-term storage unit. So that's the courier service. Now that happens in non-rapid eye movement time. The other thing that happens in non-rapid eye movement time is there's a cleaning system. And what they discovered was that it appears at this time the brain cells shrink up a little bit, which allows more fluid to flow in and around the nerve cells, and little cells called glial cells. It's the glymphatic system. These glial cells come and clean up. So what's getting cleaned up in the brain? Waste from neuronal activity, uh, waste from the combustion of oxygen and glucose at the cell, but something else, and that is negative emotions. And on Saturday afternoon, when I look at rewiring the brain, I'll show you how when we forgive people who have ever hurt us in our life, and go to bed early, glial cells are stimulated to even clean that up in the brain. It's quite an amazing process. Now Barbara will share what they learn it about what occurs during rapid eye movement. In rapid eye movement time, a filing system happens. What I found interesting is Dr. Matthew Walker is an atheist. And when he studied this filing system of all our memories, he said it's almost as if sleep has an intelligence. This is the atheist. And if I talked to him, I said, I would say he does, mate. It's called a creator God. <laughs> because when the filing of all our memories happens, it's not just haphazard. There's an order. There's an order of how everything's filed. Isn't that incredible? What an amazing brain we have. And this 
where dreaming plays a role. It appears that our dreams, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, we have some crazy dreams. You see, while we're sleeping, our reason, intellect and judgment is not active. And, and that's the part of our brain that sort of controls what we say. And, but that's asleep, so crazy things are happening in our brain. And it appears that there's a purpose for that. And the purpose for the dreaming is so that the brain knows how to file all the memories of the day. And what they have found is that um, all the positive things are filed together, the negative things are filed together. Have you noticed whenever you're feeling sad and a few things go wrong, all the wrong things in your life come up? And have you noticed when everything's going just wonderful, all the wonderful things in your life start to come up? In fact, there's a saying that, that the nerve cells that, that lie together fire together. You might have heard that saying. Uh, well, the common saying is birds of a feather stick together and you can, so you could almost apply that to the way that the brain files all our memories of the day. Please take a quick moment to like and subscribe to this video so we may continue sharing and creating Barbara O'Neill S Insights. Barbara, what else occurs during the dreaming time? It's in the dreaming time and in the filing time in rapid eye movement time that a consolidation of all the things that we've learnt through the day is confirmed. See, this is particularly important for students. And I have to tell you, we should ever be students, always learning. Does anything else occur during this time? It's in rapid eye movement time that our inventions happen. I'm the daughter of an inventor and I'm the sister of an inventor as well. My father and my brother, they're both inventors. My brother still today is uh, inventing <coughs> prostheses for, for medicine. He was, the, he was the inventor of smart card. He's <laughs> my brother's an inventor. And it's in rapid eye movement time where the inventions take place. Barbara will share how all these elements work together. So let's have a look at how these work together in the night. So they, they work in, in shifts, you could say, of uh, 90 minutes. Dr Matthew Walker, after all the research that he did on sleep, he came to the conclusions that we must have eight hours sleep a night. Eight hours sleep a night to allow everything that really God designed to happen while, while we sleep to happen. Barbara will now describe how we can achieve eight hours of sleep. And so you've got a choice. You can go to bed at eight. Sorry, you won't, can't get to bed at eight tonight. And wake up at four. We'll try for nine. Wake up at five. 9.30, wake up at 5.30. Probably that's my most common. At a stretch, you can get bed to bed at uh, 10, wake up at six. So, so let's go for the nine to five and look at how these work together. So from 9 p.m. to 10.30, that's our first... That's our first uh, shift of 90 minutes. So in that time, non-rapid eye movement, it takes up 80% of the activity, whereas rapid eye movement, it's uh, fairly dormant at that time, only taking 20%. From 10.30 to 12, Midnight, 60% rapid eye movement, and 40%, sorry, 60% non rapid, 40% rapid. So the next shift is 12 midnight to 1.30. So in that time, it's about 50 50. 50 non rapid eye movement, 50 rapid eye movement. 1.30 to 3. So 1.30 to 3 a.m., 40% non-rapid and 60% rapid eye movement. 
and then the last two hours, that's three to five, it's 20% non-rapid eye movement and 80% rapid eye movement. They did this on rats. In fact, some of the researchers even did it on their, their little children, wired them up while they slept. And then, of course, they had a lot of people that volunteered and so it was quite extensive, the research. And that all started in the 1950s where they just started to see there were these cycles in the night. So what's happening if someone gets to bed at midnight? And are they getting everything if they go to bed at midnight and get up at 8 a.m.? Isn't that eight hours? Yes, it is. But you're missing out on the pineal gland secretions. And when one goes to bed at midnight, can you see that the cleaning system isn't going to be fulfilled? Can you see that the courier service isn't going to be fulfilled? In fact, a person can wake up and they can still have some of yesterday's memories in their short-term memory unit. And what was the result of this research? Matthew Walker was surprised at the results of the research he did and the research he looked at many other people. And he came to the conclusion, eight hours. Now, some people have looked at this and felt very discouraged because they're not getting eight hours. Well, the good news is you can start to plan towards eight hours. And if you're only getting five hours of sleep a night, be very thankful. Be very thankful for that eight, those five hours because if you're very thankful for that five hours, it relaxes your brain and your body and you can start working towards getting <coughs> a little bit more. You start working towards it. When I read this book, I used to get six hours sleep a night. I used to think, since I'm 50, since I turn 50, I seem to go well on six hours sleep a night. But the problem with six hours sleep a night is you feel okay. But it's a great deception. In fact, what Dr. Matthew Walker found, that 10 nights of six hours sleep a night, 50% less cognitive performance, 50% less physical performance. <laughs> and how many people blame poor old age? Can you say that one more time about the percent of, just the last two sentences? Mm -hmm. Ten nights of six hours sleep a night, 50% less cognitive performance, 50% less physical performance. <laughs> sleep plays a crucial role in maintaining brain health and function. During sleep, the brain undergoes vital processes that help with memory consolidation, emotional regulation, and cognitive function. It is during deep sleep that the brain clears out toxins and waste products that accumulate throughout the day, which is essential for preventing cognitive decline and diseases like Alzheimer's. Sleep also strengthens neural connections, enhancing learning and problem-solving abilities. Additionally, sleep supports the brain's ability to manage stress and mood, helping to balance hormones like cortisol and serotonin. Without adequate sleep, the brain's ability to function efficiently is compromised, leading to impaired memory, reduced focus, and an increased risk of mental health issues. Barbara, how about people who work at night? What about people that work at night? Ideally, if you have to work at night, try and do it as least as possible. In fact, if it's spread out, it can be done as least as possible. And I know with my long flights to Australia and from Australia to here, I notice that the flight attendants do shift work. They'll have a few and the pilots do shift work too. So there's, there is period of times where we're getting sleep, period of times where they're not. So you do it as least as possible. And if someone... You see, we had... Um, uh, have you heard of Botany Bay? Botany Bay is just south of, um, of, a, of Australia's main airport in Sydney. And Sydney's airport, the runways go right out into the sea. And a lot of boats come into Botany Bay. In fact, I think that's about where Captain Cook first landed, so it's famous, Botany Bay. And he was the mariner that brought the ships in and out of Botany Bay. And so he was awake all night. 
And when he heard this, he thought, whoa, <laughs> what am I going to do? So I said to him, this is what I would do. When I get home in the morning, say, say he has a shift that starts at 11 and he uh, gets home at 7 a.m. in the morning, I said to him, I would go straight to bed then and I would have four hours sleep then. And then I would get up, then I would do my exercise, then I'd have my main meal and I would get my sun on my face and function through the day. And then if you're going to have to be at work by 11, then do another four hours in the early evening up to 11 and, and try doing it that way. And also exercise, do the exercise in the day. And, and many people when they do night shift, they come home and have a meal and then go to bed. Don't do that. I said have a meal in the middle of your shift, in the middle of the night and when you come home. So you can see that you can actually implement this in a way that it can, can help you get the most out of, out of, because someone has to do shift work. But ideally, as least as possible. And the last time I saw the man, he said to me, I've retired. <laughs> I said, that is good. And definitely on the days off, implement uh, as much as possible this. Barbara will now give us her final comments. So they asked Dr. Matthew Walker to do, a, to do an article in, a, in the big university, Oxford University in, in uh, the UK, on, on habits to help their students do better in their exams. So what he did was he showed how the stimulants have to stop. How many students are living on coffee? How many students are sometimes all night studying? But how much do they retain? They retain very little. So he said, go to bed at eight, get up at four, and then you've got two, sometimes three hours study time. And that two or three hours of study time early in the morning, that's equal to about six hours study time of an all night effort. He said, be well hydrated. In fact, I was interesting, it was basically all this. <laughs> Exercise in the day. And he also mentioned that, that the, the people who are, who are organising the exams don't cram the exams in. He said two exams a week. Well, they never asked him to write an article again. <laughs> but hey, how, how much do we want out of this? And he quotes a study where there were, I think there were 20 students. They all learnt the same thing. Ten of the students had six hours sleep a night. The other ten students had eight hours sleep a night. And they tested them after three months. And the difference was something 50% on their ability to retain. So those that had eight hours were able to retain. You see, that's your consolidation. They were able to retain so much more. Have you noticed that if you go to bed at 9 p.m. and wake up at midnight, you don't remember any dream? But if you wake up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., you often remember your dreams because it's in the early hours of the night that their dreaming is happening. Remember, your health is the lock, and we're here to provide the keys. Keep turning to Key Health for insights that unlock your full potential. The key to lifelong vitality is in your hands, it's just one bite away.